Hey, good morning, everyone. Marty Mazzora here. It is Friday, the 3rd of November, 2023. End of week market snapshot, followed by later today, I suspect, your weekly economic update. That one's going to be interesting. We'll get a little bit into the economy this morning in my opening monologue. Uh, then we'll get to the technicals. But first, just a comment on this market this week. As we were pretty much flagging at the end of last week, the technicals were very bullish on a short-term basis. Sentiment was very bullish because it was very bearish. It's pretty much in the gutter. I think the individual investors, according to the AAII, American Association of Individual Investors, highest bearishness of the year. And on the Investor Intelligence Advisor Survey, the bull bear spread came down quite a bit as well. Um, put call ratio was pretty high coming into the end of last week, and there's other metrics that we follow. We have our own fear greed index actually, and it moved back into the net fear column at the end of last week. So when you have positive looking technicals and you have everybody thinking the world's about to come to an end, when the market begins to move, as the charts would suggest, you got a lot of people short, you have a lot of people in cash, suddenly thoughts of year-end rallies, Santa Claus rallies, if you will, come in. Institutional investors can't be off sides. Options dealers have hedged all that put action that people had bought by shorting the underlying. All that turns, you get short covering, you get FOMO, fear of missing out with cash, then you get a whole lot of options dealer action covering those shorts. And then to the extent that people go along with calls, I had to pause there. We had, a, had an internal call that I had to take. So again, you have this amazing combination of intense bearishness. And like I've been pointing out though, for quite some time, this is 100% what we should expect. This does not change our long-term unconstructive view, let me call it. This is exactly what we've been talking about. This is the economy beginning to weaken as it showed up in the jobs number this morning, as it showed up in Apple's earnings a bit here yesterday, although they sugarcoated it pretty well, um, as it's showing up in potentially in some of the things I'm going to read to you here in a second, and the market partying on that because the correction that we had since July, like I said, I was very skeptical that that was the last leg down of the bear market because what it was based on, it was based on sticky inflation and the stubborn Fed and decent economic data. That's not what the last leg of a bear market generally is predicated on. It's predicated on declining earnings because we're now in recession or we're going to be in recession. We're not in recession yet. So that's what the next leg down is. But when you look at the character of the trading, for the last couple of years, well, it's been on, and certainly the last few months, well, it's been on the prospects for a stronger economy and too high inflation. This is just the market being very short term, very myopic, and very moved by fear and emotion in both directions. The fear of losing, then the fear of missing out. The worst thing one can do, in my candid opinion, is to listen too much to places like CNBC and even Bloomberg, where we get a lot of data and I do listen to their commentary. As I listen to it, I think, wow, I can see how people can just get whipsawed in their thinking because pretty compelling actors come on there and, uh, and tell stories that, you know, the unsuspecting consumer or investor would buy into. And at the end of the day, you know, we're all just kind of investing based on kind of who we are to some degree in our business and having done it for a long time. I recognized that early in my career and it's a lifelong struggle to set aside your personal biases, proclivities, whatever they may be, and look at the world for what it is. Personally, I am at my core an optimist. Well, and then you live through a you know, late 90s you know, and watch the market fall apart. And luckily we had a process back then that mitigated the losses and took advantage of the downs. Same thing in 2008, 2009 when the market bottomed. 
but it wasn't nearly as, and I'll say it, sophisticated as our process today. We didn't know how to hedge back then like we do now. And we, we've been able to accumulate all of that experience and then a tremendous study of history to recognize that to some degree, markets are gonna react as they always have. To another degree, the general structural setup in terms of how the world works, demographics, politics, where the emphasis is going to be. I've talked a lot about producer friendly or uh, capital friendly versus labor friendly. We're going through a shift right here. That very likely is going to mean higher inflation for longer after we get through the next recession. And that's going to demand a different asset allocation than people are so used to, particularly during the last bull market. The next bull market, I'm quite certain, is going to be characterized by the conditions that more or less characterized in the recent past the market between the tech and the real estate bubble. We had a weaker dollar on a trend basis, foreign dramatically outperformed the US. I think it's going to be very much like that again. I do think there may be more emphasis on dramatically under-owned commodities in a higher inflation environment. And we can get into the weeds of US you know, debt to GDP and how we need inflation, but I'll probably do more of that again on my lengthy year-end essay. So, um, so anyway, but in the here and now, um, we are seeing the rally that we should see based on weak economic data and how the market has been trading. If this data continue to weaken, it's going to really show up in corporate earnings and the market and people are going to wake up and it could be sooner than later, but I could see this rally continuing to year end. I mean, I don't think there's a reason to, to uh, go hard against that right here, but ultimately somewhere along the way between here and you know, the next recession, the market is going to see it and discount it. And it's going to be in the earnings and the earnings outlooks. So speaking of that, let me not take too much of your time this morning. Let me just kind of paraphrase. I really appreciate Peter Bookvar. We pay for his research and he just helps us a ton in terms of really sifting through earnings announcements very objectively and giving us, you know, what key players in the, for example, the retail sector have to say. And this is from an interview this week with Brian Cornell of Target there and there being the consumer managing that budget really carefully and it's certainly pressuring discretionary spending they're buying less stuff even with food and beverage we look at the overall retail spending just look at the top line and you say all right there's a healthy consumer and they're spending but even in food and beverage categories over the last few quarters the units the number of items they're buying has been declining so they are even tightening up their spending in those categories. But in discretionary goods, we've seen seven consecutive quarters of both dollars and units declining. So there's more, but I'll stop there. So that is a huge warning sign. But you know, all of us know that as we go out to the stores, right? Now, how about, and I've, had, I've talked to people about this, how about uh, Live Nation, right? Live entertainment. This is, just virtually the opposite of what I just read to you in terms of sentiment. As you can see from our results, the structural tailwinds behind our business are accelerating faster than ever. And as the fan demand truly globalizes and artists are able to perform more broadly than ever, this is fueling an unprecedented global desire for concerts. This has happened in all levels with both casual and diehard fans and from small clubs to massive stadium events. What a you know, what a contradiction, right? From two different you know, companies talking about what they're seeing and the prospects going forward. Booking holdings, pretty much the same thing. Of course, you know, travel to the Middle East, of course, is curtailed a bunch. Now, going back to goods, right? And consumer, here's Etsy. As you all know, there's been significant pressure on consumer discretionary product spending as high inflation, elevated interest in mortgage rates, splurges on YOLO experiences, think back again to those concerts, and declining savings balances have meant that there's little left over for many, for many consumers after paying for food, gas, rent, and childcare. So folks, I mean, are we gonna see this all come to an abrupt stop? I think you can, I think we might. I think ultimately it does come to a huge slowdown 
and it may be worse than people on Bloomberg who I listened to this morning uh, expect or want to see happen. Um, the Fed has tightened at a more rapid pace than it has virtually in history. I mean, that's not just going to go unnoticed by the economy. Uh, Milton Friedman said, monetary policy works with long and variable lags, and that's for certain. When you put, when you put $5 trillion in the pocket of consumers and businesses, you know, it's going to be a long lag, but ultimately that has to be digested through the economy. And when that's, you know, when that spending comes down, some of these earnings outlooks are going to come down with them. So do I know that it's going to play out ugly? Of course not. Is the risk very high that it plays out ugly sometime next year? You bet it is. So we're going to remain hedged. We are going to begin adding duration to the portfolio, longer term fixed income investments. We sidestepped that at the end of last week because of concerns over what the Bank of Japan was about to do or still needs to do. And we'll probably get into those weeds in our year-end letter as well as a real risk to global assets for a while. But there's a move that Japan is going to have to make to undo a, a very stubborn economic policy that is just killing the yen. And now they're finally seeing some inflation and they're going to have to tighten policy. When they do, and I'll get into these weeds, I promise, in the next couple of months, but when they do, um, there's probably going to be a mass exodus of international investment. Japan, the yen, has been the, a monster funding currency for carry trades. And sorry, folks, I will get into that. But essentially, it's borrowing in yen at virtually nothing, zero interest rates, investing that money in other parts of the world where you can pick up some yield or buy U.S. equities, certainly U.S. treasuries. When this unwinds, and the, and the yen is at you know, multi-decade lows, right? When this unwinds and the yen begins to go up with yields in Japan, suddenly converting borrowed yen to foreign currency becomes a very, very risky proposition because now you need a lot more of that foreign currency to repay those loans. So again, getting more into the weeds than probably most people would prefer me to. In our core portfolio, we're actually exploring now a way to maybe leverage a position in the yen for the next year or so because uh, I do think the yen is going to be very strong before this all plays out. So there was an anticipation Monday because of something that was released on the Nikkei Newswire that they may actually drop a bomb Monday evening. They actually did in essence what Nikkei suggested, but they did it kind of stealthily. Uh, made commitments to, you know, to, to keep it relatively tight in terms of its impact on the world and blah, blah, blah. So willing to print yen and continuing to do a number on its currency. But at the end of the day, the yen is way too low, but it reflects stubbornly low interest rates because of very stubborn Japanese policymakers. So again, I'll leave that one there. I rambled further into that than I should have, but in the written blog, probably with our lengthy year-end letter, I'll really give you the texture on that and, and help you understand what I'm talking about. So anyway, in the meantime, uh, let me just stop there. There's so much more I want to say, but I'm going to do another one here later today on the economy. So let's just quickly go through the technicals. Those of you who don't like the technicals, thank you for watching and I'll see you and, uh, and you'll hear from me again very soon. Since I have it up, let's just go ahead and start with the dollar. Remember folks, I said that this chart and the chart of the 10 year treasury yield looked very bullish to me for stocks. Why? Because stocks are trading up when the dollar trades down most of the time. That won't always be the case, mind you, but that's how things are trading. So what do we have? We had this range in here, right? And then we had our bearish divergences and here we are breaking down out of that range below the 50 day moving average, just as the technical said we should. That's bullish right here for stocks. Um, the 10 year yield, remember I said, this looks like it's really technically really set to break down. Did it ever, boom, 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 down again today, coming up the, off the bottom a little bit, very strong for bonds. Um, here you go, you know, the technicals basically played out here. Forget about the news, forget about everything that happened this week, the technicals were pointing to what we just experienced. Looking at the S&P on the daily chart, I am gonna do this quick, like I said, Remember, we, we pegged this, remember the beginning of October, right? Uh, we said, look for an early month rally. We got it. Uh, it retraced about half of the decline from September, rolled right back over again. 
we have pretty much retraced all of the October decline right here, right? The setup looked very similar, right? Sentiment was very similar coming right off of this area. That bear flag pattern played off literally right to the target on the nose. This is not a bear flag. I thought maybe we'd flag up a little bit, but we just screamed right through the 200-day moving average. That's very bullish. You know that brought a lot of people in. Oh my gosh, that was a whipsaw. It was a head fake up through the 20-day moving average, and now testing the 50-day moving average. I said originally when we were down in here, I said 4,200, 4,300. Man, we just shot right through there without looking, without really looking at anything. So the technicals said, you know, let's get there. The news, right? I said that if it was a strong jobs number today, this would have turned exactly in the other direction. And I'll get into the details of the jobs on the economic update. Um, but it was, it was a weak number. And therefore, again, easy peasy, markets trading on weak data. That's not how this ultimately plays out if the data continues to weaken like we think it will. In terms of the, uh, the NASDAQ, um, same thing, right? Uh, big rally today. Um, you know, what do I need to say? And then you got, you got a little, you get your buy signal here on the MACD from below the zero line. That's right where you want to be. So you know, up above the 50 day moving average, you know, party on for now. Um, so clients, I, I don't do this every time in the videos, but when I do these, I don't do a morning note. Usually in the morning note, I tell you, uh, I tell you how the core is doing. Um, uh, everything's up except for range resources is down 40 basis points. That's been a great position for us, by the way, a natural gas company. Energy stocks, obviously oil is trading down today. Energy stocks and then uh, uranium miners are down 2%. So and that's been a good position for us as well. So three positions out of, as of this morning, 33 are down. Uh, the rest are up a bunch. We added REITs recently. They're up 3.5%. Our rare earth ETF is up 3.3%. Our water, our water services ETF is up almost 3%. Mexico equities are up 2.5%. Um, metals miners are up almost 2%. Uh, silver is up almost 2%. We have a tiny position in Dutch Bros. It's up 1.7%. Asia Pacific stocks are up 1.6%. U.S. materials are up 1.5%. Emerging market, our main ETF is up 1.5%. Then U.S. industrials up 1.29%. AT&T up 1.2%. Emerging market bonds up 1.2%. Anyway, I could, I could keep going, but uh, clients, as you know, that your client, your portfolio is not a stock market portfolio. We're still about 50, a little between 50 and 60% stocks. The rest are some of the things that we just mentioned here. So it's a global macro portfolio and it expresses our view of the global macro risk reward setup. And we are hedged with S&P 500 put options. And that was gold in the last two weeks of October. And we've had to manage those a lot here this week so that we catch this rally. So in this kind of market, well, you want to catch the upside when there's some to be caught. With the uh, potential for recession in 2024, net-net, you want to be somewhat defensive. You can't catch the upside without catching some downside. You just don't want to catch all of the potential downside. I don't know that that blizzard's going to hit using my analogy from midweek. Uh, I just know that the risk is high. but. We'll, uh, we'll continue to be humble, open-minded, and bring you the world as we see it day in and day out. Thank you, folks, as always, for watching and listening. Talk to you a little bit later. Bye-bye.